sorry for for people who are not Spanish speakers. But I know most of people is talking Spanish now. Uh, so I'm going to do the live here in, in, in Instagram. Okay. So there you go. Buenas noches. Estamos eh, hoy con el doctor Joao Paulo Almeida. Es una de las revisiones que estamos haciendo de el servicio de neurocirugía del Hospital de San José de la Fundación Universitaria de Ciencias de la Salud. Y hoy tenemos como invitado a nuestro amigo y colega Joao que nos va a dar una charla sobre eh, los abordajes quirúrgicos para los meningiomas de, de fosa anterior y va a hablar un poco de cuáles son los abordajes endoscópicos para, para cuál, cuál es el rol de estos abordajes endoscópicos endonasales para estos eh, meningiomas. El doctor Joao, eh, es, eh, bueno, su nombre creo que es más que evidente que es de, de, de Brasil, ¿cierto? Él estudió medicina en la Universidad Federal de Ceará. I'm sorry if that's not the correct pronunciation of it. Um, Está muy bien, no, no, no te preocupes. Ok. Y um, bueno, ha hecho toda su uh, carrera como neurocirujano en, en Brasil y posteriormente ha hecho un entrenamiento enfocado en cirugía. Eh, abierta y endoscópica de base de cráneo en distintas eh, instituciones. Él, él estuvo uh, recientemente terminando su um, fellowship clínico en, en la Universidad de Toronto y actualmente se encuentra haciendo el fellow clínico en Cleveland Clinic. Creo que esa es uh, como una introducción. Uh, Dios, uh, ahora en adelante vamos a hablar en, en inglés. La charla está proyectada para, para hacerla en inglés y vamos a dejar todas las preguntas para el final. Si las tienen, las van escribiendo por el chat. Entonces, uh, so, Joao, now is your time. I'm going to stop sharing here. Uh, so, thank you very much for uh, sharing with us all your experience on, on this talk. The very interesting talk about the uh, thank you, Edgar. It's a pleasure to be here with uh, all the friends and colleagues from Colombia and from other different countries as well. I'm sorry I'm presenting in English this time. Maybe next time in a face-to-face -face, uh, meeting, I'll be speaking in Spanish. <laughs> I have to improve my Spanish a bit, but I'd like to thank for the opportunity. And uh, today we're going to uh, have a chance to talk a bit about a topic that is, uh, I think, very interesting for, uh, you know, everybody who has a focus on skull base. Uh, we will be talking today about uh, endoscopic and nasal surgery for the management of uh, anterior fossa meningiomas. And... Uh, and uh, I like uh, saying that uh, for anything, we'll be, we'll be working around the brain in the intracranial space and uh, even more importantly, around the skull base, either from above or from below, the knowledge and understanding of the surgical anatomy is, is paramount. So uh, uh, the, the concept of going back and forth from the lab to the OR is, is mandatory. Uh, th that concept I really learned um, from Evandro de Oliveira, who was my mentor, my professor in Brazil, and a really uh, very uh, important uh, uh, guide in my career. And as you see, everything we go and we do in the lab, we need to be able to replicate in surgery and the problems we have in surgery we need to go back to the OR and better understand that anatomy. And it really doesn't matter what type of surgery you're doing, uh, because that, in my point of view, is, is a true fact for all the procedures we deal with in, in your surgery. So, 
Regarding disclosures, I really have no financial disclosures, but I have to say that I am from Brazil and I'm from the northeast part of Brazil, not too far from Colombia, so we share the same weather. Uh, I was uh, neurosurgically raised in, in the Evandro de Oliveira family, uh, so I'm really very passionate about anatomy and I really have to thank this man who is going through a very complicated moment in his life, as, as we all know. But uh, I have to thank him. I have to thank all the people who he trained, including Mateus, my dear friend, Dal Fabro, who was my, uh, one of my first mentors in endoscopic pituitary surgery. And this guy who is Pablo Ricinos, who is uh, my supervisor here and mentor as well at Cleveland Clinic. Uh, after that, I went to Canada and I met Dr. Fred Gentili, who, was, who is uh, and continues to be a big friend and professor and mentor in endoscopics called Bayesit, and with Gentile, his entire team, including uh, Dr. Gallery Zade, who helped me a lot, and the entire ENT family in Toronto, who I'm very happy to have been part of. Uh, and then now in Can in United States, I have to always uh, thank as well my friends and colleagues, Alfredo Quinones Hinojosa from Mexico, and now Mayor Jacksonville, who was one of the first to really bring me to the United States uh, for research at that time. And Ted Schwartz, and, and that's the common um, background that Edgar and I share. He also spent time with Ted, who is a fantastic uh, person as well, and who, by the way, is his birthday today. Uh, and here now I'm at Cleveland Clinic with uh, Pablo Racinos and Barunka Chetri, those two guys right here who are my uh, supervisors and mentors and friends who are leading this entire team of people which is a strong, young, uh, bright-minded uh, group of people who are really uh, trying to improve this field of skull-based surgery. So uh, I don't consider this my presentation. I consider this a mix of results that, that I have a chance to, to share with all the, those people and even more people that I, I may not have mentioned at this point. So when we think about anterior fossa and meningiomas, uh, we, we understand that there are different ways to look at those tumors and different ways to classify those tumors. Uh, one, of the, one of the ways is uh, really looking at the, I'm sorry for that, is looking at the location of the tumor, where the tumor is arising from. So we have uh, tumors called tuberculum meningiomas, which will arise right at the tuberculum region. We have planum meningiomas arising from the roof of the sphenoid sinus, so-called planum sphenoidale. And we have the so-called factor groove meningiomas who will arise either from the crib form plate or from the foveate moidalis at uh, the region right anterior to the planum sphenoidale. We have the WHO grading system, so we can classify them from one to three according to how aggressive those tumors can be. And then now we have new studies that are demonstrating the role of epigenetics, uh, up to epigenetics abnormalities and, and uh, behavior in the prognosis and behavior of those tumors. Uh, and this is likely to be incorporated in the near future in uh, pathological classification of meningiomas. Treatment options will go from observation and follow up with image uh, and may also include surgery that can be done open and endoscopically. Uh, conservative treatment, radiation options, and chemotherapy. Of all of those, chemotherapy is the one that really hasn't uh, got uh, much uh, development up to this point, at least as far as my knowledge goes. And uh, however, all of those other options have been uh, very important and really are the main, main ground for the management of uh, meningiomas, especially the ones in the anterior fossa. When we talk about opening endoscopic surgery, uh, I don't think that's a really a point of discussion anymore. I think it's getting clearer and clearer uh, the cases who should be done endoscopically and the cases should be done open. Uh, but there is still some controversy. And, uh, but the most important point is that uh, what evidence do we have up to now? And really when we look at the numbers and the papers that have been published, we understand that the evidence is really still uh, you know, being uh, published. And so we really don't have very strong evidence to support one or the other in my, in my point of view for some cases. Uh, surgical anatomy uh, here is just to remind everybody, uh, you have to go to the lab, you have to go to the lab, you have to go to the lab. A microsurgical training has been reinforced by many giants of neurosurgery going from Yashargil uh, to Evandro in Latin America and especially in Brazil. 
Uh, many countries, including Canada and United States, have incorporated the concept of uh, competence-based training that will incorporate uh, the knowledge and the practice in the neurosurgical anatomy lab. And I think that's a model that should be considered for uh, many other training programs as well. This is the lab in Sao Paulo, the first one that I had chance to, to work at. And, and this lab really changed my impressions regarding anatomy. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very nice place in the Hospital Beneficencia Portuguesa de Sao Paulo, in Sao Paulo, Brazil, that uh, it has its door open to you know, all neurosurgeons interested. It's a place that many, many people from Latin America used to go and still go. And uh, I do encourage everyone to visit. When we look at the numbers in the experience of trainees in microsurgical laboratories, we see that uh, most of them will feel much more comfortable with any surgical approach by going to the lab. And uh, even the, the assistants, the, the staff neurosurgeons will feel more comfortable in allowing those trainees to participate in the procedure uh, once they understand that the trainees will have had trained in the laboratory before. So it is uh, basically a good both for trainees and for uh, professors and attendings uh, for that, that experience is available in your training program. So that just reinforces how important to go to the lab is uh, today and, and I believe it will continue to be in the near future. When we look at the surgical anatomy of the skull base, and those are just some beautiful rotund pictures, uh, we looking at the anterior fossa, we need to understand the anterior fossa and to divide it in three compartments, which really is a division more so we can understand what are the important neurovascular structures uh, in each one of the segments of the anterior fossa. So the first one will be the tuberculum region, which really the tuberculum really is this little dot area right here at the junction of the planum with the junction of the cella compartment right anterior to the uh, uh, prechiasmatic, prechiasmatic sulcus. So it's a very narrow space, but the important point is that it's located right below to the optic chiasm. And that's gonna be very important. We're gonna talk about that in a second. And if you look at the relationship in this axial uh, dissection here, you're gonna see that the most important structures that are gonna be related with is the optic, are the optic nerves and the optic canals, laterally to the tuberculum. Right anterior to the tuberculum region, you will find the plano sphenoidale, which is basically the roof of the sphenoid sinus. That region, uh, looking at closely here at the axial plane, once again, you see that the anterior limit most of the time will be the posterior ethmoidal artery, which usually runs about uh, around five millimeters right in front of the sphenoid face. So basically, one can say that everything posterior to the posterior ethmoidal artery couldn't be considered plain on the sphenoid valley. And therefore, everything ahead, everything anterior to the, that posterior ethmoidal artery will be located in the so-called crib form region, uh, which is more an anatomical concept that was developed in the endoscopic age, which corresponds to the crib form plate in right at the midline and the fovea ethmoidalis, which is the ethmoid process located right medial to the medial wall of the orbit. And basically it's where uh, the cells of the anterior and posterior ethmoid are located and where the ethmoidal branches will run uh, towards the midline. Once we understand those concepts, uh, it is also important, I'm sorry, to remember the location of the frontal sinus and its relationship with the crib form plate. That's gonna play an important role when deciding if you will proceed with either an endoscopic or an open approach for a section of the most anteriorly located meningiomas. Finally, I'm not gonna go into many details here, but the understanding of the optic canal in the orbit is very important as well when dealing with tumors in the anterior fossa, of course. Uh, most tumors located laterally in the orbit, they will not be good candidates for endoscopic approach. That is very easy to understand. Look at the optic nerve, and there's a beautiful illustration here in the paper by Blyer. You see that the optic nerve will basically block your surgical uh, corridor uh, going from medial to lateral if your lesion is located more laterally. So open approaches is still are the main stand for lesions located laterally here, but endoscopic and nasal approaches are good. Uh, are good options for tumors located medially in the optic canal and also in the medial aspect of the orbit. Today I want to focus in the optic canal when we look at this presentation. We're not going to go into the orbit itself, but it's important to understand that tumors, meningiomas, 
that occupy this medial aspect of the optic canal are good candidates for endoscopic and nasal surgery. Previously, there was some discussion if endoscopic would be able to remove tumors inside the optic canal. That is, of course, doable today. Uh, however, if the tumor is arising laterally to, in the lateral aspect of the optic canal, that tumor should be selected for, an, uh, if gross total resection is the goal, it should be selected for an open approach. So talking about surgical approaches, uh, we do have, uh, of course, open transcranial microsurgery as the gold standard for most of those tumors, uh, especially up to the development of endoscopic and nasal approaches. We have uh, bilateral corridors, such as the subfrontal transbasal interhemispheric approaches. We have unilateral approaches, such as the unilateral subfrontal, frontal lateral approaches, as demonstrated here in, the, in those anatomical dissections we did recently such as the Terriono approach, the modified OZ, the OZ approach, and also supraorbital and eyelid approaches. When we look at the, those approaches, of course, they will have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, basically, open approaches, uh, you can choose, you can select each approach you're gonna use according to the location of the tumor but they are uh, approaches useful for resection of all sizes and locations. Uh, they provide a 3D microscopic view, a very good working space and maneuverability in most cases. Reconstruction techniques uh, in those cases will lead to low post-op CSF leak rates if compared to endoscopic and nasal cases. Uh, dissection of tumor vascular encasement is it is easier if done uh, through an open approach compared to endoscopic approach. And we do have papers published demonstrating the impact of long-term follow-up and long-term results of those cases. And only now we start to have more and more publications demonstrating the long-term results of endoscopic and nasal surgery for meningitis. However, it, of course, it does have some disadvantages, including the need of brain retraction that could lead to parenchymal injury in some cases. It requires manipulation of neurovascular structures, so you need to cross most of the time uh, the, optic, uh, carotid can, uh, the optic carotid corridor or the carotid oculomotor corridor or the interoptic corridor to get uh, good access to lesions, especially the tuberculum lesions. Uh, you may have some limited visualization, especially if you're working below the optic chiasm, therefore, especially for, op for tuberculum meningiomas. And uh, it, may, it has been associated in the literature with visual worsening that can uh, occur basically in no cases, in up to 30% of cases. And of course, that will vary according to the an anatomy of your tumor, the extension of your tumor, and how uh, bad the patient presented uh, before surgery. Uh, regarding the scopic and nasal approaches, we have many advantages. We're going to go from below, so we're not going to cross any of the nerves. We're not going to cross the carotid. We're going to be working the midline space, and basically everything is going to be available after the bone and the dura is open. So it's, a, in theory, less invasive uh, and more direct approach compared to open approaches. Uh, this term, minimally invasive for endoscopic and nasal, I don't know if I would favor that that much. We're still opening a big corridor, but indeed, if it is less invasive to the brain itself, if compared to, the, to open approaches. Uh, no or minimal brain retraction, a wide panoramic view with endoscopic, uh, especially with angle endoscopes these days. And it allows a very good early devascularization of the lesion that will facilitate tumor resection in most cases. It, reset, it allows a, a, a better so-called Simpson grade resection due to the resection of dura and also bone uh, structures in the anterior fossa and the midline anterior fossa. And it does have some disadvantages such as the 2D vision, which uh, personally I don't think it's a, a disadvantage itself with the high definition of the scopes we have these days and with the getting in and out of the endoscope with an assistant uh, Personally, I, I, I don't think that this 2G vision is, is a disadvantage up to this point. Uh, uh, it can lead to some problems with maneuverability and therefore that's why more laterally located tumors have a more challenging resection. Uh, complication management, uh, definitely an injury of a frontal basal or even perforating branch is much more challenging to be controlled 
uh, even today with the improvement with the technique and endoscopes and instruments, then if you do the same case uh, through an open approach. So microsurgery still leads to some better uh, and easier management of complications. And of course, for lesions located lateral to the optic nerve and internal carotid arteries and, and lateral respect to the optic canal, the microsurgical open lateral uh, approaches should uh, be selected and they will lead to better results regarding external resection. Reconstruction in CSF leads, uh, the rates have improved significantly in the last 15 years, and especially in the last 10 years with the vascularized flap. However, the rates still are somewhat superior to uh, the rates presented in transcranial cases. Um, nowadays, one could claim uh, around a 10% CSF leak rate, 5 to 10%, I think it's a more realistic number. But of course, once again, it will depend on many factors that will include uh, how heavy your patient is, so the BMI of the patient, uh, the body mass index, uh, also, if the patient had or not a previous procedure, if the patient had or not previous radiation, how lateral is your resection, if the patient has a vascularized tissue available, and then your technique, if you have been able to uh, harvest ad adequately uh, your vascularized nasoceptal flap, if you're using fasciolite, I think fasciolite is very important in those cases. And if you've been able to uh, keep that patient in bed rest for about 24 hours or so. I think those are all factors that will play a role here. Uh, the use of the lumbar drain has been proposed as well. I think that's up to discussion, but we do have one paper from the group at UPMC that was a randomized trial that did demonstrate a uh, significant uh, reduction of CSF leaks in patients who had surgery in the anterior fossa. So that's the best evidence we have up to this point, and that evidence suggests an improvement regarding CSF leak rates in the anterior fossa. So all those points should be taken into consideration when deciding uh, what to do and what not to do in those cases. So looking at the anatomy, we went through those details. So as we said, we would divide them in three regions. The tuberculum is the most posterior one, the planum is the one in the midline, right above the, uh, the sphenoid sinus, and the most anterior one would be the cribriform plate. Looking at this anatomy from below, we're gonna use anatomical dissections here to show step by step of each one of those procedures. So starting with the anatomy of the transtuberculum approach. Uh, doing this approach, uh, usually uh, there are many nasal techniques that can be done to uh, approach the sphenoid sinus and tuberculum to get a good visualization of the tuberculum region, therefore, uh, you should at least have a wide sphenoidotomy and a good visualization of the optic, uh, optic carotid canals and optic carotid uh, prominences and recesses laterally. And to get that, you will need a posterior thmoidectomy bilaterally. Usually that will also require uh, at least a partial resection of the superior turbinates bilaterally. Uh, however, uh, you can preserve the middle turbinates uh, in selective cases at least. And also, of course, you should harvest your flap in those extended cases. So here you see, this is a zero degree endoscope view and an anatomy uh, dissection here that we did recently as well. You see the rostrum sphenoidale, the sphenoid ostrums, you're gonna see all that anatomy. Then once you do a big sphenoidotomy, you're gonna have to identify all these structures in the back wall of the sphenoid sinus. And once again, anatomy, 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 you need to be able to identify uh, and to see, have this 3D vision to identify what will lie uh, beyond this bone in the back wall of the sphenoid sinus. So when we look from uh, in the midline from below all the way to the top, the first recess we see, it's gonna be located right medial to the paraclival ICAs or paraclival carotid arteries. That's the clival recess. Going above, this is the main anatomical landmark here. It's the cella and the pituitary gland. And right above the cella, we're gonna find the optic nerves running the optic canals. So if you look at the optic canal here on the right and in the left, you, if you follow them immediately, you're gonna get this connection plane here. And right at this connection plane, you will find the limbus sphenoidale. The limbus is basically a dural fold, so you cannot see it right now, but it's gonna be located right behind this bone. And how do I know that? It's because we understand that the limbus will be located at the point of junction between the roof of both optic canals. 
Why is that important? Because the limbo is the point that will separate the plantum anteriorly from the tuberculum inferiorly. And we're gonna discuss once again why this information is important. So proceeding with this, we have removed the bone of the cella as the first step. After removing the bone, you see here that I just, I'm just showing how prominent, prominent in this case, the midoclinoid process is. So we remove that, but to remove the midoclinoid process is really not uh, necessary for transtuberculin approaches. It can be a step to be done if there is a cavernous extension, but it's usually not necessary. But then we go and we proceed with removal of the tuberculum, the bone in the tuberculum region, which is right below the limbus. So basically the tuberculum region will be limited laterally by the optic canals, inferiorly by the diaphragma cella, superiorly by the limbus. And this corner that I'm pointing right here is the, op the medial optic carotid recess. This corner is just like the keyhole in the terional approach. And uh, therefore, uh, when you go and you're doing the terional, you drill the sphenoid ridge and you get that angle to mobilize the dura, here's the same thing. You do remove this bone here, exposing part of the carotid, so you can manipulate the dura and get this lateral exposure that otherwise you would not have. So here you see that we open the optic canals, uh, expanding our transtuberculin approach. And this is what we do when we have a tuberculum meningioma infiltrating into the optic canals. And this is basically your transtuberculin approach. In most cases, we don't stop here. We usually go a bit beyond the limbus going in the plantar region just to be able to create a bit more of space. So you see that usually we open a bit more of the plantar just to get this dura exposed. For cases that arise in the tuberculum, as you see the tuberculum is right here, those lesions, they will be located in the infrachiasmatic space. As you see, the chiasma is located right here and the tuberculum was right here. So if we go back here to this slide, if a meningioma is arising in the tuberculum, if it is a real tuberculum meningioma, this tumor will be pushing the chiasm up or backwards and therefore, this tumor will be located either anterior to the chiasm or inferior to the chiasm. If the tumor arises from the plantum, this tumor is going to be located above the chiasm. So it's a suprachiasmatic lesion. And therefore, your extension of your approach needs to be extended more anteriorly in order to be able to deal with that tumor in an adequate fashion. And that's why for tuberculum meningiomas and craniopharyngiomas, which are also usually infrachiasmatic tumors, that we only perform a tuberculin region uh, and that's usually enough for a safe and effective resection. But for plantar tumors, once again, for tumors located above the chiasm, to expose this, this region up anterior to the limbus is necessary. Here, when we open this space, if it was a meningioma right here, he would be right in this place. The three stars here that you see is just showing that this is the most anterior arachnoid band of the chiasmatic cistern. And when we open that arachnoid band, we're gonna see the contents of the uh, chiasmatic cistern, including the pituitary stalk and the little branches that are the superior hypophyseal branches supplying blood to the optic nerves and chiasm, and also to the pituitary stalk. If you proceed with dissection, you're gonna be able to see the interpeduncular fossa. And here you would see the mesencephalic part of the liliquis membrane separating the chiasmatic and the interpeduncles in the prepontine cistern. And here, when you open the during the plantar region, you will see the anterior communicating artery complex right above the optic chiasm. And of course, therefore, this region is to be carefully manipulated if dealing with tumors uh, located in the suprachiasmatic space. Now, moving forward, now we're going to talk about a second approach, which is for more anteriorly located lesions, the so-called transplanal transcript form of pleural approach. This is a different specimen compared, uh, different from the last one. So here, once again, we need to have that 3D view. So when I look at this dissection here, the, this is specimen, we need to locate the cella, which is going to be right here. This most prominent part here that you see, this is the clinoid segment of the carotid or paracellar carotid artery. 
uh, that is here and here. And then you're gonna find right above that the optic canal on the left and the optic canal on the right. Once I have find, found all of that, it's much easier to identify the rest of the anatomy. I just follow the roof of the optic canals and I can see this should be the limbus sphenoidale. And all of this is gonna be the chiasmatic region of the tuberculum region. And this here is the plan. So we go ahead and we're gonna drill a lot of that. We're gonna find the cella, we're gonna find the optic canals, we're gonna see the limbus sphenoidale. And then here we're gonna see the plan region. As we talked before, we always have this little vessel that is the posterior ethmoidal artery, about five millimeters or so anterior to the sphenoid face. And that's usually the limit for your planum approach. And you can see this beautiful relationship of all those structures. But when you look more anteriorly, and that's necessary when you want to remove uh, crib form of factory groove meningiomas, you need to understand the relationship of the crib form plate, which is right here, the fovea moidalis, which is right medial to the lemna papyrusia, which you can see here and here, and the frontal sinus that has already been opened right here. How do we get to this view? We had to remove the anterior ethmoidal cells and the posterior ethmoidal cells. If you don't completely remove those cells, you will not get this exposure. And the frontal sinus is open as well. This is what we call a draft three approach or a luthrop. Uh, it is important to get that so you avoid blockage of the frontal sinus and also it gives you this nice view of the most anterior part of the skull base. Uh, here in this picture you see two important vessels that need to be carefully coagulated and dissected when you're doing a transcript form approach. This first one, it's originated more anteriorly and it runs in uh, oblique fashion towards the midline from posterior to anterior. This is the anterior ethmoidal artery that will be located uh, posterior to the frontal sinus that you see right here. It's located about 10 to 15 millimeters posterior to the frontal sinus. And back here, this is the posterior ethmoidal artery that you see it has almost like a perpendicular plane uh, with the medial wall of the orbit. So the anterior ethmoidal from posterior to anterior in oblique fashion and the posterior ethmoidal in a perpendicular fashion to the midline. In surgery, uh, you can, to get this nice exposure, you can drill between the arteries with a diamond burr and you can drill right posterior to the posterior ethmoidal artery and then you dissect carefully. Here I'm using a double ball probe. You can use a cuddle, you can use a Roton 10 dissector. And after that, you're gonna isolate, coagulate with your bipolar and cut that vessel. After you do that, you're gonna be able to have this corridor completely clear, and then you can continue with your drilling and exposure to be uh, fully exposed in the anterior fossa. And here you see that I mobilized it. I opened the medial wall of the orbit. I removed the lamina papyrus, and here just mobilizing the contents of the orbit to get this view of the orbital roof right here. Here in the midline, this is the most superior part of the nasal septum and crista galli. We're going to remove that. A suggestion that, that we have is that you see that I drill laterally and laterally, but this is still connected in the midline to the most anterior part of the plenum and to the posterior wall of the frontal sinus. So this is the last part uh, that I would drill here in order to avoid getting this too mobile before uh, the adequate time because you're gonna to have to drill this and thin it out before completely removing it. So we drill, we thin it out, and then we can get the complete exposure of the durante anterior fossa. You see that the cristagalli has been removed, and then you can open the dura with uh, care to preserve the frontal basal uh, branches from the anterior cerebral artery uh, and the little veins that will be running here in the frontal basal uh, lobe. Uh, and then you can complete uh, the draw opening. Of course, your meningioma would be located here and then you would be dealing with that tumor as we're gonna show in some of the following videos. So here, we're gonna show a few surgical cases and I'm gonna uh, move a bit faster with the videos just so we can take a look at everything. But uh, we have a few cases. So this is a case number one. This is a case uh, courtesy of uh, Fred Gentili, my mentor from Toronto. This is a case we operated on. It's a 45 year old gentleman with a history of a blurred vision, visual decline. And basically you can see that vision was declining, especially on the right eye. And you see that MRI showing this tumor located in the tuberculin region, 
with some extension towards the left, the right side. Uh, what approach in this case, considering its location, it's located medial to the optic and to the carotid, uh, we consider this to be an excellent case for endoscopic and nasal approach. This is a beautiful video edited by Aristotle Calivas, who is a, a, a Scobase fellow in Toronto right now. Uh, this is being uh, published for education of everybody interested in this area. So here, I'm gonna just skip this video a bit. And uh, let me just go back a bit. So here you see this is a beautiful, well pneumatized sphenoid sinus. You can see here a declinoid segment of the carotid, clinoid segment of the carotid, the cella, and here the optic canals beautifully exposed. This is the region of the limbo, and this, this is the region of the plane. Sorry for that. And here, you're gonna see that the dura was open. The drill was completely uh, performed here in this region. And here is just mobilizing the tumor softly. Here you see uh, Dr. Gentili mobilizing this tumor and preserving the arachnoid plane, just like we do in open procedures. Uh, try to use that as a protection plane for our neurovascular structures. And then you see here, he working now uh, near the optic canal in this most lateral aspect. Uh, while preserving the arachnoid and then the tumor completely resected. Uh, and then we're gonna have a beautiful view of the normal anatomy, the optic chiasm, the optic canal, the tumor that was extending more laterally and the pituitary stalk. After that, the tumor is removed, reconstruction is done with fascia lata, follow inlay, which means inside the dura space and onlay, which means covering the dura and the bony defect and then followed by a piece of vascularized nasal septal flap uh, kept in place with uh, fibrin glue, surge cell, and a folly balloon. The patient had a visual improvement after surgery, no CSF leak, and was discharged in post-op day four. So very good result. Case number two, this is a bit of a different story. As you see, this is a 37-year-old gentleman. This is once again a case that we had in Toronto with a history of visual decline in affecting his right eye as well. And you see similar visual decline here, but take a look at this scan, especially the coronal MRI shows that this tumor is now going laterally to the optic canal. And if you look at this axial scan, you see this extension here. Since this is a young patient uh, with visual decline and it's relatively a small size meningioma, Ideally, we would proceed with a surgical approach that would give us the best chance to achieve gross total resection. And therefore, because of its location in relation with the optic canal, we selected an open approach. So this case was operated on via Terriano approach, an extradurocliniodectomy, opening up the optic canal and removal of the tumor leading to gross total resection. This case, it's a very interesting case You see. This is a 55-year-old patient that we saw in here in Cleveland Clinic with Pablo Recinos. She had a uh, previous meningioma resected. She was doing well, but then she started to notice a visual decline in the left eye. She had MRI scans and uh, this little, little lesion was found right at the left optic canal. Uh, because of this lesion and its location located in the most lateral aspect of the optic canal, uh, once again, lateral aspect of the optic canal. What did we do? We did not do an endoscopic. We did an open approach. We did a left terrional approach. And uh, here you see that the tumor was completely resected. This was done, I'm sorry, a pretemporal approach with an extra duraclinoidectomy. I'm just gonna move this video a bit faster. So here you see the clinoid was fully exposed in an extra dural fashion drilling the clinoid gently with a diamond burr. Here you see that I'm just going and reducing the amount of bone in the clinoid inside out. And then here just using a rotor number two, mobilizing the drill away from the clinoid. And here we continue drilling up to the point that the clinoidectomy was completed. And after the clinoid was mobilized, we proceeded with drilling of the roof of the optic canal, which led to adequate exposure of the optic canal.
and this this video always stops here at zoom and anyways we opened the canal we removed that tumor and uh, achieved a gross total resection of, of this case this was the little meningioma right here and then the tumor was completely removed the usual technical difficulty here. Okay, back to the game. Uh, case number four, this is a 73 year old man who has presented uh, to us here at Cleveland Clinic with headaches and hyposmia and uh, enlarging plantar meningioma. So he was initially seen here, had a small meningioma, no real symptoms, and then uh, we were just following, but then he started to in the MRI scan started to show progressive enlargement of this tumor and uh, his olfaction was uh, being uh, deteriorated. And then we decided therefore to recommend surgery. Uh, had no lateral extensions, uh, the olfact was declining. So what did we decide? We decided therefore to do an endoscopic approach and achieve a complete removal of this tumor. This is a case we did with Dr. Varunka Shatri, who is one of the skull based surgeons here at, at Cleveland. Let me see if I can move this video here. Okay, so you see here that uh, I'm just working to achieve and finalize this co-base uh, exposure. So here's the optic canal, and you see the movement of the drill in an oblique fashion above the optic canal. And right here in the midline, you can go from caudal to cranial. Uh, after that tuberculin exposure is completed, then we proceed with uh, the exposure of the plenum region as well. So here I'm going now towards this, the plenum and I'm gonna drill some of this bone in the midline. And also we're gonna connect this bone in the most lateral aspect. Of course, neural navigation is uh, very useful uh, for, for making a decision regarding how much bone you're gonna remove. And we did use neural navigation in this case to confirm all this anatomy. You see that the technique is always the same. You thin out and blue line all this bone, thin out, drilling as much as possible, then you can remove the residual bone. Here, this instrument, it's a very interesting one. It's called a coblator. It helps to control the bleeding from meningiomas, and we use this coblator a lot for all endoscopic and nasal meningiomas. It helps us a lot. You see the dura opening here. This, the tumor is right here already. And I'm just going to skip this a bit. You see the meningioma right here. It was not too large of a meningioma, so we could do a you know, very limited intra tumor debulking and then carefully dissect this tumor around, careful to preserve the little branches of the ACA that were posterior to the tumor. You need to use sharp dissection to remove the attachments of the tumor to the arachnoid uh, of the frontal lobe, as you see here. And uh, being very gentle using microsurgical techniques, you can mobilize the tumor from the attachments to the basal frontal lobe and achieve a complete uh, tumor resection. You see uh, here, just disconnect, I'm just disconnecting the top of the tumor in the most anterior part. And here we're uh, coagulating and cutting some of its attachments. And then finally, the tumor is completely dissected and we're gonna be able now to finally completely remove this tumor and uh, get a gross total uh, tumor removal of this uh, plenum sphenoidale meningioma. As you see, for plenum meningiomas, uh, I consider it to be a bit more straightforward procedure rather than for tubercular meningiomas because you're really not dealing with the optic nerves and superior hypophyseal branches. And here, this is a technique that Dr. Kashetri and also Dr. Asinas, they appreciate a lot. So here, what we did is a button technique with two layers of fasciolata, followed by a vascularized flap. And uh, you can see this beautiful flap that my colleague here, Dr. Tang, in ENT harvested in the beautiful reconstruction of the skull base. So you see the post-op MRI, this is uh, with contrast, just the cavity and the reconstruction. You see here the large flap covering the entire anterior fossa. Case number five, this is more like a gray zone, in my opinion, about doing endoscopic or open. Uh, take a look, this is a 35-year-old woman with a history of neurofibromatosis who presented in clinic with a history of headaches. She had 
other small meningiomas in other locations and had this uh, sizable uh, factor group meningioma growing especially in the foveate moidalis region, the right side, the cribriform plate on the right side, but had no further lateral extension. So preserving this midline point in the mid orbit, uh, the tumor was not extending lateral to that. So basically this patient, we discussed pros and cons with this patient, and she already had some loss of, uh, of smell as well, and uh, she decided that she would favor an endoscopic approach. Uh, and we proceeded with that. We proceeded with a transcript form approach. Uh, in this case, uh, this was a case we did in Toronto with uh, Alan Vaskin, who is our ENT skull base surgeon in Toronto, and Gallery Zade, who is one of the skull base surgeons in Toronto. Here you can see the video of this case. I'm going to skip the nasal approach, but I should reinforce that, that uh, in my training, at least, I spent a lot of time with the ENT surgeons, especially Alan Vaskin, who is an incredible surgeon and did the approach for this case. Uh, I think that for all neurosurgeons interested in endoscopic and the nasal surgery, this collaboration with ENT surgeons is, is mandatory. You really need to be comfortable with this anatomy and with uh, the techniques uh, applied uh, and used for ENT surgeons with, who specialize in this area. So here you see Alan just exposing the frontal sinus here, coagulating some of the small branches of the anterior and posterior ethmoidals, uh, which is gonna lead to this nice exposure here. He's just drilling the posterior wall of the front of sinus. And then we're going to start working and uh, debulking this tumor. So here you see that the cribriform plate has been exposed. We're going to cut the dura and the anterior fossa and get this nice view here. The meningioma has been debulked. It was a soft one. And here we can use a patty, mobilize the tumor, uh, margins slowly dissected away uh, and get a very nice uh, exposure and dissection of this tumor. As we dissect it, uh, we go 306 degree around the tumor, and then you're gonna be able to see that we're gonna achieve a complete uh, dissection of all the planes, and once the tumor is completely freed, we're gonna be able to achieve a gross total resection of this lesion. This most medial component was adhering to the fox that we had to cut in order to be able to remove this tumor piece. And you see this is a pretty sizable tumor that we de debulked the central part of it, but then we were able to uh, fully disconnect from the surrounding frontal lobe and to get this nice resection. Uh, and then the attachments of the tumor to the fox are being cut here. As you see, the left side was barely touched. We basically worked on the right side here. The reconstruction is then done. You see hemostasis with surge cell and reconstruction with uh, some duragen, some fascia lata, and a vascularized flat. In that case, it's important to mention that she did have a, a small CSF leak that was managed with use of a lumbar drain for five days, and then that patient has been doing well since then. Uh, but she did, uh, of course, completely lost uh, her ability to smell. She still had some before surgery was not intact, but now the smell is gone. So that's the downside of an endoscopic approach in a case like that. Case number five, uh, this is a different case. This is a courtesy of Fred Gentili as well. You see this large olfactory groove meningioma in a 52-year-old man with headaches and visual decline. Take a look at this tumor, extending laterally to, uh, all the way laterally to the uh, most lateral point of the orbit and going all the way up, encasing some of the A2 branches right here and with a significant extension uh, from cranial to caudal, larger than 4.5 centimeters. A case like this, in our opinion, uh, it still is better suited for a transcranial approach. That's what was performed here, a bicoronal uh, subfrontal transbasal approach that led to this nice exposure. And you see here the final result with uh, gross total resection of this tumor. The downside is that uh, the anterior fossa here, as you see, was not drilled as you can do from below, but indeed it is my opinion that this result in, in this surgical success is much easier to be accomplished with an open approach rather than endoscopic approach. Uh, case number five is just to illustrate how the combination of surgical approaches and, and treatment modalities is important. Take a look at this 65-year-old man uh, uh, from China, but with family in Toronto, uh, had history of headaches, uh, speech problems, and visual decline, showed up with this left 
uh, is fin medial is finoid wing meningioma rising here from the cli from the clinoid. Uh, then he was selected, of course, for an open approach. Underwent a left frontal temporal approach. Get this nice resection, but did have some residual tumor left right and medial to the optic uh, carotid uh, space. And uh, you see here that this patient was lost to follow up uh, for four years, and then he showed up with a new visual decline now. And, uh, and basically this tumor that was mostly in the midline, but also had this lateral component. Since it was mostly in the midline, we selected an endoscopic approach for this case, but with the understanding that this lateral component would not be resected. The goal in this case, therefore, was to achieve visual improvement. Remember that he was 65 in the first surgery, so now he is 17 years old, and that we already had the problem of follow-up the first time. So the goals would be to minimize visual problems in this patient and to follow with radiation. The first surgery, he was a meningioma grade one, and this time he underwent endoscopic surgery. We did have a very good a surgical resection, but some lateral component was still left. And then he underwent uh, IMRT radiation for treatment of that residual tumor and is now being followed clinically and with MRI scans. So regarding results, uh, we have to look at all results. And here I'm going to show one of the papers that I collaborated with the team in Toronto. Here, the series from 2006 to 2016, uh, only including patients with uh, no previous treatment. You see that uh, 26 underwent endoscopic, 26 underwent open approaches. So this is uh, a subgroup of all patients treated in Toronto. Um, you see that external resection rates are not that significantly different but open approaches still have a, a somewhat higher result with 77% of gross total resection in the open approach cohort. Uh, and uh, you see that visual improvement uh, between open and endoscopic approaches had no significant differences, but the endoscopic group had a longer uh, stay in the hospital if compared to the open uh, cohort group. And once again, the differences was not statistically significant, but the endoscopic uh, group had three cases with a CSF leak and open approaches only one case with a CSF leak. Uh, you see that recurrences, they do happen if you follow those patients long enough, uh, even in open or endoscopic uh, groups, even if grade one, but especially in grade two. But you see then this endoscopic cohort, four patients had, who had subtotal resections, had, resect, had recurrence, and one patient who had a gross total resection had a recurrence. Uh, the SRS was a modality, the gamma knife was modality for treatment in, in one of them. Open uh, patients in the open cohort group uh, had recurrences as well. Two who had had a subtotal resection, one who had had a gross total resection, uh, which once again shows that the natural history of those tumors uh, require a long-term follow-up and that gross total resection will lead, as we know, to a, a smaller, lower chance of recurrence if compared to subtotal resections. And then we need to look at the evidence in the literature. And as we talked in the beginning of the presentation, uh, the literature presents many, many, many papers, but a lot of what we discuss are ba is based on a single center experience uh, in retrospective single center experience. Uh, as we know, that's likely not enough, but uh, in surgery, and especially in skull-based surgery, that does demonstrate uh, the experience of, of uh, selected teams. Uh, there are many systematic reviews in the literature. We uh, particularly had a chance to collaborate with Ted Schwartz and his group with this paper number two here, looking at the results of endoscopic and nasal for olfactory groove meningiomas. And when we look at all those systematic reviews, we can uh, see that they have some uh, similarities. First of all, for tuberculosis cell meningiomas, we have similar gross total resection rates if open or endoscopic. Endoscopic and nasal surgery is associated with higher rates of visual improvement, and open approaches have a lower rate of CSF leak. Olfactory groove meningiomas, open approaches have higher rates of gross total resection. Endoscopic and nasal have high rates of CSF leak, and endoscopic and nasal lead to uh, olfactory dysfunction. Uh, all of this is, uh, can be criticized, and it's not too complicated to criticize all those results because this is an overall picture of those tumors. We need to look at then at subset and subcohorts 
to better define uh, which approach we should do. As we talked about tuberculin cell meningiomas, if it is a laterally a tumor with a lateral extension in the optic canal, an open approach is probably better to be selected. And if it is a small midline olfactory groove meningiomas in a patient who already lost olfaction, uh, the chances of a post-op CSF leak rate in that tumor is, are actually uh, small, in, uh, at least in uh, considering the current results with the current techniques. So that all needs to be considered when reading and, and, and discussing the results of such systematic reviews. Also, we need to understand that endoscopic and nasal approaches have been around for about 15 years for management of those cases and microsurgery at least since the 60s. So I don't know if that's exactly a fair comparison up to this point, but now it's getting closer and closer. Uh, so beginning, the initial series had the impact of initial learning curve, which we did not have with microsurgical series. Instruments were not optimal instruments, which now are getting better and better. Uh, and then we had the problem of case selection. So we were comparing oranges and apples, which as we said, it's not the best way to deal when comparing uh, treatment strategies. Then uh, the approach would be to uh, consider matched analysis. And then we see this is a study, a matched analysis study uh, from a combination of results from Toronto and UPMC. Uh, and we see here in this study that basically extended resection and Simpson extended resection was not that significantly different, but Simpson grade was better in the endoscopic cohort. Uh, and uh, surgical complications were no different between open and endoscopic. As conclusion in this study, no significant differences in clinical outcomes were observed, but endoscopic and nasal had less radiographic evidence of frontal lobe injury on post-op scans, which in my opinion does not necessarily translate in a clinical outcome. Uh, but the, the main result here is that they didn't find much differences in a similar cohort group. Uh, the group at uh, Cornell, so Ted Schwartz group, went ahead and did a similar study, but now for tuberculosis salamin and geoma. So they compare patients with similar tumors that were operated through an open air endoscopic approach in a retrospective fashion. And you see here that extended resection was similar. Uh, but endoscopic and nasal had a higher rate of visual improvement and fewer uh, seizures, which are positive points towards doing it endoscopically. Once again, the same criticism is valid. Although they're matched analysis cohorts, they do not necessarily represent uh, a similar uh, a group in a sense to recommend an overall treatment, uh, best treatment for all cases. As conclusions, Transcranial and endoscopic approaches are safe and effective options for the management of anterior fossa meningiomas. Case selection is paramount and should be considered and should consider team experience. Uh, endoscopic and nasal for scope based meningiomas should be performed by a multidisciplinary group, including neurosurgery and ENT head and X, uh, and being performed in high volume centers. Uh, unfortunately, meningioma being an intradural pathology will require more experience than the more usual pituitary or extradural pathologies, and therefore they really should be selected uh, for a team that is used and has a volume of cases rather than to deal with this once a year or something like that. Uh, characteristics of the tumor should be considered as well, must be considered. Uh, endoscopic and nasals still have uh, some uh, better results for smaller lesions with midline location, no lateral extension, and no vascular encasement. But open approaches, they are uh, useful, should be selected, especially for lesions with lateral extension, with vascular encasement, and uh, for those who present with multiple uh, invasion signs, such as pyo invasion, for example. And finally, of course, patient's preference should be taken into consideration. Uh, of course, we should not be known for an endoscopic and nasal procedure just because the patient is interested in a minimally invasive treatment and has an extremely large tumor with a lateral extension. That should not be the case. But uh, for a tumor suited for both approaches, of course, patients should have uh, a voice in the decision-making process. Of course, we need more research. We need more multicentric prospective studies. We need long-term follow-up and recurrence rates. And we need to understand the real impact of such a combination strategy of approaches in the long-term result of patients with uh, meningiomas. Uh, thank you very much. I want to finish with this beautiful picture of my hometown, Fortaleza, in the northeast part of Brazil. 
And uh, well, I wish I would be here in this beach today presenting this talk virtually from the, the sand right here. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Joao. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. Um, I want to say thank you for your very nice and interesting presentation. And I'm sure folks have many Um uh, I would like to invite people if they have questions to um, put them on the chat. Si tienen preguntas para ponerlas por favor en el chat. Um, I, I would like to ask you a couple of things. Um, I don't know if you have seen that, but um, I had a case where uh, I did in the, in the first time an endoscopic approach. Um, I couldn't get out all the tumor. So there was a, a little bit and the tumor started growing. And so we had to do a second approach. So in the second, time we decided to go uh, transcranially and I was fear because of the reconstruction you know uh, that we did in the first approach I don't know exactly and I use neural navigation for that case and I don't know exactly if you have seen any uh, damage of those reconstructions with a second approach or what to do, actually, I haven't seen that before. Uh, uh, you mean the first approach was an endoscopic approach? Yeah, so we did, a, mm -hmm. you know, this reconstruction with a nice septal flap. And, and that was in the crib form plate? No, it was a tuberculum cell in the German. I see, I see. Well, the, that's a very good point, actually, because indeed, when you work in, in the skull base from above, uh, you may just go through the vascularized flap and, you know, end up having problems for sure. The, in, in reality is, at least uh, in my experience, most of the time, that plane that you created with a vascularized flap, that uh, is, uh, especially if it is a viable flap that has not had any necrosis or anything like that, will be a plane that will be quite safe to, you know, to be dissecting above that plane. So usually in, in that little space, I'm not usually too concerned with that. Of course, if the concern is that the tumor is extending through the reconstruction, then you can consider doing a combined procedure, which means you do your surgery from above, you do what you have to do from above, and since you're concerned with the flap, you can mobilize the flap and then replace it. But I would only consider doing that if you have a tumor, such as some residual trans ethmoidal tumors that are extending into the nasal cavity again, yeah. which is uncommon. So you mean like doing a combined approach in the... In the, in it's not the, not even like doing a combined approach really it's just mobilizing the flap uh, rather than working from below again i think that in a case like that if you have to go from above at least in my experience the vascularized flap creates a nice plane that uh if you're careful enough you can preserve that plane of course uh since you would be going from above i would consider harvesting a pericranial flap and using that tissue as an added layer for reconstruction Right. So, um, the other question I had uh, is: there any limit for you, like with, with the with things that you have lived with these tumors? Uh, like, is there any anterior limit for uh, making you think to stop going under nicely? Uh, I think the the posterior wall, the frontal sinus, is one of them. Huh. I think that's the anatomical limit that you should take into consideration. I think the, the other really issue is the nasal anatomy of that patient. If that patient, for example, has a, a septum perforation, if that patient has a nasal septum that will not allow harvesting of vascularized tissue for reconstruction in an adequate fashion, that is a patient that for a meningioma, uh, I would start thinking about uh, going from above. Uh, so basically, uh, in the midline, I look at the posterior wall, the frontal sinus, and of course, in the lateral aspect are the orbits. So if it goes, you know, beyond the orbit, uh, then that's that's a tumor that I think should be considered for an open approach. Thank you very much. I would like to share. Um, so, so the case I was uh, talking about. Uh, so let me share my, my screen for a second. 
Mm, right. So this is the. Are, 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 can you look mm -hmm. at my? Okay, so, yeah, so yeah, looks looks nice. uh, the pre-op, right? Um, mm -hmm. So we had this uh, tuberculum cell, meaning Joma, and we, we use all the learn um, navigation to verify where to go interiorly. But, and I decided to to go Indonesially in this case because mm -hmm. I felt that it was you know in the mid lane and I could go pretty straightforward uh, without you know, trying to avoid damage of a neurovascular structures. Uh, mm -hmm. However, um, I had to left, uh, let's see if I can show here. So we have here, excuse me. So we have here, uh, the ACA, right? The A command, mm -hmm. and so here we, we couldn't, find actually the the left optic nerve and I, I I wasn't feel comfortable to take out this piece of tumor because I had no uh, good visualization of you know the, um, mm -hmm. the ophthalmic artery at that point so I left yeah. this bit of tumor there um, let me let me show you the past up imaging so uh, okay this here so I, I had this mm -hmm. of tumor, right? Mm -hmm. And this started growing there. And uh, unfortunately, it was like the same, you know, the same size afterwards. So w when I came in the second time, uh, I felt that there was no a clear, you know, um, plane for, for dissection between the tumor and the, and the Nice septal flap and all the reconstruction. Actually, we used um, not only a nice septal flap but also a, a gasket seal, you know, and all, mm -hmm. all the complete reconstruction of the facial ladder. So mm -hmm. I, I couldn't actually uh, differentiate it. So I don't know, as you were saying, I think, <laughs> uh, and you did a frontal, you did a terional as a second yeah, phase. Yeah. I think that I would use like different strategies. I would try to first identify the healthy bone, you know, the one that you didn't uh, open in the first approach. So I'd go from planum to, to towards, from planum towards the tuberculum region and try to differentiate uh, potentially whatever structure you would have in that plane. And uh, at least like in my experience that, that facilitates that, that maneuverability there. But I think you're right. I think that, that if you go through that tumor and that tissue and if it becomes a problem, you need to have strategies about how you're gonna seal that defect. Uh, you had a gasket seal from below, so I think you're more protected than most people would because like the gasket seal, it's not, not everybody would harvest, a, would do a, a gasket seal for that. So you have a solid reconstruction from below. So if anything, you would probably cut through a fascia rather than cutting through the vascularized flap first. So I think you could be more aggressive at that point because of that. But I would definitely harvest more pericranium, try to get some vascularized tissue if possible, which is challenging that area, but I would use pericranial, temporalis fascia, whatever needed, if I would uh, see a perforation of the reconstruction in the end of the procedure. Yeah, I was. I feel pretty scared because it was the first time that I had to deal with that situation. You know, it's not yeah. that common. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's a, it's not an easy case. In, in that first approach of yours, I think you had a very nice result, of course. Uh, the one thing that I was going to, to actually suggest you to look at is at your exposure. Because sometimes the challenge that one may have, especially on the left side, is how much lateral exposure you're able to achieve with your approach. Yeah. Uh, which uh, is the criticism when you use a gasket because for the gasket, you need to preserve some of the bone in yeah. the lateral aspect to be able to get the gasket seal in. Yeah. And uh, it's very good for reconstruction, but may limit your exposure. So uh, if you, maybe if you were to remove a bit more bone, I, had, I didn't see the approach, but if you were to do that, maybe you would be able to remove that, that part of tumor as well. Yeah, when when I was opening the optic canal, um, you know the 
it was so vascularized at that point that I couldn't, you know, I couldn't get into the optic canal as mm -hmm. much as I would like to. So I couldn't yeah. visualize the the ophthalmic artery at that point. So I was I was scared. And that was the reason that, why I left that portion of tumor. Yeah. That's a very good point. Uh, that's why I think it's very important to look at those tumors and try to understand where they're really originating from. Because when you look at most of those tuberculum cell meningiomas, they arise from, from the tuberculum and then they grow laterally into the optic canals. And when they do that, usually they push the ophthalmic artery downwards and laterally. So the midline plane is usually preserved and protected. So you're not going to get into it. But one nice instrument that I really learned to use here at Cleveland, I, I was not familiar with it before, is the scublator, which is something the ENT surgeons use it a lot. It really helps a lot, in, in, especially in those large meningiomas. Basically, you go inside it, and it, it not only coagulates, but also almost like aspirates the tumor. Interesting. And it works much better than an ultrasonic aspirator. And uh, it really facilitates this procedure. It's like a, a large meningioma. It's, I guarantee it's going to take, uh, I don't know, half of the time that it would take because you would have to stop and coagulate and so on and so forth. Interesting. Thank you. Very it can be pretty bloody. You're right. It's kind of like sometimes you're... <laughs> I, yeah. I've also had tuberculum meningiomas that we couldn't remove completely. Everybody has got those and it's, it's a challenge. It's not always that you can remove it all. No, it's always challenging. I know. And it's sometimes just frustrating when you cannot get it out like a piece of... You know, piecemeal fashion that you always want to take them out. So I, I don't know if you want, we have a couple of questions here in, uh, in the chat. Uh, maybe you mm -hmm. would like to, to help us answer. So uh, in regard with infections, is there a difference between both approaches? That's a very good question. Um, uh, of course, when endoscopic and nasal surgery was starting, that was the big uh, criticism, right? Everybody was saying, well, you're going to get through the nose into the brain. Everybody's going to get infection and meningitis and so on and so forth. That doesn't really happen. We have enough evidence to say that there is no, uh, nothing pointing that endoscopic and nasal cases would lead to a higher chance of meningitis or other infections uh, if compared to open approaches. So regarding overall infections such as meningitis, I would say no. When you look at anterior fossa meningiomas such as uh, olfactory groove meningiomas, one concern is always the frontal sinus. That concern is there either if you work from below or from above. You always need to, if you go from above uh, and you do a bicoronal, you need to be able to cranialize that sinus uh, or to be able to close it. Uh, we always cranialize the frontal sinus. And even though we know the chances of complications such as mucoceles and infections, we've all seen that. And uh, when you go from below, you need to be careful not to block the frontal sinus and not to get a mucosil because of that. So those are the concerns that one may, should have, but, but basically, long story short, no, there are no, no differences there. And the, the, I don't know, when, do you, do you use any um, limit or when, when you are trying to open the bone, when do you feel uh, comfortable to open uh, when you, I mean, I have a concern when you are opening the bone that you see in the image that the, the limit of the tumor, you know, is like exactly there. How much you would you like to open the bone more than the limit of, of the tumor? You mm -hmm. know, like I, I I don't know exactly because when you are going to do the reconstruction, it's it's challenging. But sometimes you feel that you need a little bit more of you know uh, normal yeah. dura that you want to take it out also to avoid yeah. uh, a recurrence of the tumor. Yeah, I mean. Uh, uh... Of course, uh, ideally, we all try to get uh, the adequate exposure right as before opening the dura. But sometimes, because we really don't want to, you want to avoid creating a large hole that you're going to have a hard time closing it afterwards. And I've been there, like I did, like an anatomical uh, transcript form approach when I really didn't need one. I just needed a transplant, and then you have to close all that that you opened, right? So that's not ideal. And uh, and, and the other way around is also not ideal, to have a very minimal exposure. So I think you need, for anterior fossil meningiomas, use the navigation, get that to help you, especially for the cranial aspect in the crib form plate. And um, 
uh, most of the time you can just drill right at that edge and then you're going to do some debulking in the inside the tumor and and after you do that you're going to start dissecting and at that point you can realize if you need to remove more dura or not so that's usually what we have been doing and uh, it, it works fine nice the, the other question um so dr william Contreras is asking uh what, what is the vascular image protocol for endoscopic approach and do you consider pre-embolization of the uh, endoscopic yeah. approach cases so uh, i think every single center has a different imaging protocol for not only this case but for endoscopic cases in general i know that uh if i'm not wrong i think ohio state and and upmc which are very strong groups in endoscopic they they tend to do ct angiograms before surgery for planning uh, we don't usually do that uh, but i think uh, it's not truly really necessary in a case like this uh, but in other tumors like chordomas may be very useful. Uh, so basically, no, we do not use routinely vascular imaging for those cases, unless I would consider a CT angel if it is a meningioma that has a significant encasement that I'm concerned, but it would be something not ordinary. Uh, regarding pre-embolization uh, for anterior fossa meningiomas, I would say no. I don't think that's... Uh, uh, a necessary or even a, a good option because the problems of reaching the moidal arteries uh, endovascularly, it's not very easy to reach there to that area safely. Uh, you always have the concern with the ophthalmic artery when doing that. And also when you go endoscopically, uh, it's pretty relatively straightforward to see those vessels and to coagulate those vessels before attacking the tumor. So I don't think uh, you would be too concerned with pre-op embolization in those cases. Yeah, yeah I feel the same. I, I, I don't know. I mean, if it's a large tumor, probably uh, I would go from, from above, you know, you feel what you feel more comfortable with. I have seen Ted also going through the eyebrow yeah. <laughs> for huge meningiomas, uh, but you have to combine the microscope and endoscope. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that uh, in the end of the day, you can talk and talk and talk and talk, but I think nobody, and I trained with, with Evandro. So uh, <laughs> I remember this one day that I did a, a tuberculum meningioma in Sao Paulo, and then Evandro the next day called me and said, you know how many tuberculum meningiomas I have? I never had a problem. You should have given this case to me. I said, I'm not going to give you this case. <laughs> I'm going to give it through the nose and, and it works well. But if you are a surgeon who is used and have very good results within your open approach, either if you do bicoronos or terionos or supraorbitals, whatever you do, and your patients are happy and you have a, a good practice, I think you stick with it. I don't think you need to change just because somebody came and said that endoscopic is fancy and you should do it now. Uh, but I think the reason why we change is because we have, uh, all of us, we have problems and limitations and sometimes bad outcomes and we start reflecting on our practice. And I think uh, endoscopic now is actually in that moment of undergoing a review of its use. A lot of people were doing everything through the nose and now we are more uh, rational about its use. So we're going more things through open approaches again. So I think it's important to find that balance and, uh, and to understand your limitations, your practice, your preferences and your strong, uh, your strengths and, and then use those in your advantage. Thank you very much. You know, I'm really grateful with you and it was a very, very nice presentation about this topic and I hope we can have new virtual conferences in the future, right? In the coming future. Um, so we can uh, keep talking about endoscopic approaches. That, uh, I know that there are many limitations right now with the COVID pandemic and all that stuff, but uh, we yeah. can't we can't stop doing these academic uh, events in order to keep moving forward. So I really appreciate to accept my invitation for this 
Richard. No, I mean, uh, it, is, it is truly my pleasure. Uh, I was honored to, to do it and I'm very happy to do it. The only one thing I have to say, no, I, I disagree with you. It's the last time we're doing it virtually. Next time I'm going to Colombia. Sure. And, and, and then uh, I want to visit Colombia and visit you guys and uh, have fun in Colombia. <laughs> Absolutely. We can have a couple of Alguardientes here. Is, <laughs> so we can, you know, hopefully next year, you know, we have uh, what we're supposed to have a WFNS next, yeah, I know. Come, next year, come here in, in, in Bogota. So we, uh, I hope you can come here and talk about uh, all the endoscopic cases here in Bogota and we can have a nice time together so we can share. No, I mean it would be it would be an honor. Of course I'm kidding. Of course I'm, I'm more than pleased uh, to kind of uh, have engaged in more discussions and as I told you before to learn with with your group as well. Uh, I think we all learn a lot when we share our experiences and, and our you know strengths uh, with each other and uh, well, I'm Brazilian, I'm, I'm Latin American, and I know how good surgeons we have in our part of the globe. And I'm very proud of, of my background. So uh, to have a chance to collaborate with, with uh, your center and with you, it's, it's an honor for me. So thank you very much for the chance and the opportunity. Thank you. Have a good, have a good evening, right? Like, what time is it in? in... So right now it's, it's uh, 8.22. So it's still, the sun is still right there. So it's still uh, like uh, not even sunset yet. Not yet, yeah. It's <laughs> dark here already. So um, uh, let's keep talking and thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Have a very uh, good night, Edgar. Uh, thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.